This time on episode 451 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. We discuss the 1992 X-Men animated series season 4 episodes 8, 9, and 10 as presented on Disney+, Plus, and weekly Marvel Studio news, including Kevin Conroy, the legendary Batman voice actor dying at 66, the Deadpool 3 news trifecta, and Tom Holland reportedly closing a deal for a Spider-Man 4. I'm Chris from Play Comics, a show where we look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material, a part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other astonishingly geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. You have been granted clearance by director Alfonso Mac McKenzie. Stand by for a shield debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the shield director. Now it's time for a scheduled debriefing. I'm Agent Michelle. I'm Agent Chris. And I'm producer of the show, Director SP. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. We're a Marvel Comic Universe fan show discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Marvel Comic Book Universes as told on screen by a wildly successful company called Marvel Studios. This show is recorded on Saturday, November 12th, 2022, as it is snowing for Michelle and I, live from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. studios and broadcast Timeline Y. Come and join our live chat as we record. And if you didn't already catch on to it, we love talking about Marvel because of repeated time loop stories. Again. If you'd like to talk to us about time loop stories, if you'd like to talk to us about time loop stories, if you'd like to talk to us about time loop stories, you can visit our website, legendsofshield.com. If you feel like we might have done this already, leave us a voicemail at 844-THE-BUS-1. That's 844-843-2871. But only do it once. We're on Twitter at Legends of Shield. Stop with this. YouTube. Oh, we're on YouTube. At Gunna Geek. I feel like I said that already. If you would like to discuss which timeline is the prime one, you can join our Discord server at gunnageek.com slash Discord. And remember that Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a proud member of the gunnageek.com network. A few times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been part of the network a few times. Actually, we never really left, but if we did leave, it's because Steven kicked me off because I... Must have pissed him off or something like that. But we're here. We're part of the Gonna Geek Network. We're all here. And uh, sadly, Lauren is not with us today, but the rest of us are. And we're ready to talk some X Men, the animated series again. It's nice to get to do it again. It is. We only have so many of these left. Previously on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. Hey, sometimes it has to be a dynamic duo. It was as though, hey, we have this episode done. Do you want to air it or do you want to wait another two months for the one that's supposed to be here in the story? And Fox was like, if it's done, we're putting it on air because we need a Saturday morning cartoon. But he's an old man. He deserves to be looked after. You don't shake somebody with a concussion. So have you ever gotten something from the fridge and then you hit your head? Four seasons in and we finally get the origins of the X-Men. Yeah, I see this episode. It's like, this is the true prequel. This is what actually happened. Gene, use your mind. The Shadow King with the power of astral friendship. And I want the mind of the most powerful mutant so I can kill all the other mutants. The whole, let me use what I hate to kill what I hate. I can just imagine that Larry Houston was having fun with this episode, throwing those cameos in. Boom, 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 boom. Well done, Chris. Well done on the previously on this week. Well, when you've got the pew pew pews right there, it's got the ending written for you. 
definitely does. All right, let's talk specifics here. X-Men, the animated series season four, episodes eight through 10 premiered on Fox Kids on May 13th, 1995, September 9th, 1995, and September 16th, 1995. Nightcrawler was the May debut, and then One Man's Worth Part 1 and Part 2, mercifully, were back-to-back in September 1995. Michelle, where were the IMDb descriptions of these episodes? Nightcrawler. On holiday, Rogue, Gambit, and Wolverine must protect Nightcrawler, a demonic-looking but kind-hearted monk, from a misled community. One Man's Worth Part 1. Trevor Fitzroy and Bantam travel back in time to 1959 and kill Professor X. One Man's Worth Part 2. Failing to stop the assassination of Xavier, Bishop, Shard, Storm, and Wolverine travel forward to the future. All right, that's what happened in these episodes, basically. The IMD descriptions are pretty Good on that. Chris, what were your first impressions of these three episodes? Actually, what hit me was just a sense of what are we willing to give up in order to make the world a better place? Who doesn't like a good time travel story? Really? Who doesn't like it? And the X-Men apparently have a lot of time travel. I wonder if Hugh Jackman can match the grumpiness level of this Wolverine. <laughs> Especially in the first episode, right? He was pretty grumpy. A lot of good one-liners in there, too. Let's start off with that first episode, right? It was the Nightcrawler episode, and I honestly had to scratch my head a little bit because I misremembered in my mind. I thought, didn't we already get introduced to Nightcrawler? And I was thinking of the Iceman episode that we did before and not the Nightcrawler episode. So I'm glad we've got both single episodes of both. But Michelle, what did you think of the Nightcrawler episode overall? I liked how it touched on Nightcrawler, the comic character. He does have a history of being shamed for not only being blue, but also having the like the three digit fingers and the tail, especially the pointed tail. And I really like how for one second, we saw they kept his origin of him being Mystique's son. That was great. It really, for those of us who's read the comics and everything, it was just Howard, they worked that in there and they have this little flashback And he doesn't know that his mom's mystique. He just knows this woman. But we see her flee, change into mystique, and abandon Nightcrawler. Very touching at that point in time. And we've already been introduced to mystique. And she's not that great of a character that we've run into so far, particularly with Rogue, right? So this was an interesting backstory to the whole thing. I'm glad we got the Banff. You know, he's going back and forth and teleporting and everything. I'm glad we got that. That was indicative of his powers and everything. I'm glad they kept that in there. I was a bit taken back by his accent. I didn't realize that he was supposed to have that deep of an accent. Oh, yeah, that's a thing that exists. You don't always get it written so that you have to read it that way in the comics. But it's clearly what it should be, especially with his background. Did you guys catch the Spider-Man cameo in the ski lodge at the beginning of the episode? No. Mary Jane Watson was sitting there drinking from her Spider-Man mug. Nice. What's that? (laughs) Like, she just takes her Spider-Man mug back and forth. It's got a web on it. That's why I say Spider-Man. She just takes it everywhere. And also her clothes are in her general colors of Mary Jane and she's got red hair and everything. And also in the ski lodge are Clea and Dr. Strange. I don't know if you guys caught those cameos or not. No good work on spotting those cameos. Also there's a dude as they're panning left to right in the ski lodge. There's a dude in green that is walking across the ski lodge It's not for sure, but you might call him Norman Osborn. You know, I think 
that worked in there as well. So Larry Houston was working overtime trying to do subtle cameos in this episode. He was the director of the episode too, by the way. He's a master slipping in, com- you know, cameos. He is. At the end of the episode, I'm just going to go right to it. Wolverine is in a church praying. It surprises me how much religion they got into this and how much they would put in a Saturday morning cartoon. I was a little bit taken aback that they would even go that way, but maybe they needed to just seem normal. I don't know, to get past the censors and everything. Like, what do these guys do on Sunday morning? I don't know. Well, let's make them go to church every once in a while. So is it part? I don't remember it being part of Wolverine's comic background of him being so religious. Not that I can remember right now, but it is a big part of Nightcrawlers and Wolverine isn't exactly opposed to trying something out to see if it'll help him. At least in that aspect, it fits in, at least in my mind. And is it just me or were the 90s and the 80s, the late 80s and the 90s full of avalanche sort of movies and TV shows? Was that a big thing back then? I seem to recall it being a big thing back then. Yes, I remember a lot of episodes and even little specials about how to survive an avalanche. And one of the things I remember from all of those is if you're stuck, you spit because gravity will take your spit. So if you're upside down, you'll know if you're upside down, if the spit will go away from you. But if you're right side up, the spit will stay because you're right side up and that's where the, and everything. So I remember that. They're like, well, because that's part of with an avalanche in order to get out. If you dig the wrong way, you're digging yourself deeper. And I guess Wolverine spit because he knew which way was up and he could get his claws and get everybody out. I was a little bit surprised that Rogue couldn't get them high enough to get out of the way of the avalanche in time. But I guess that's how the plot went. So she had to take the dive. And they had to get Gambit injured. (laughs) so he's there in the lodge and he's still to this day trying to score with rogue at all any other takes from the uh, nightcrawler episode i'm just impressed that they had an action adventure sequence and slipped god in there Yeah, I mean, most of what I'm looking at with censorship is Nintendo-based, just because I think that is fascinating, what they will and will not let, or would and would not let, in most cases, through. And we had a whole episode focused around religion and a monk going basically evil because of religion, and it's like the two things I would expect to never be allowed on a Saturday morning cartoon. And there they are, all nice and together. I thought the fights were okay. They were, you know, subdued. It wasn't big fights or anything. It was more of a mob mentality, right? Which fits along with Nightcrawler perfectly. This must have been the end of, since it aired in May of... 95 this must have been the end of season three i think when it came out i don't know if it was the last one or not i hope it wasn't the last one but it is in season four now with disney plus and we talked enough about that so i'm just gonna let that one lie well then we get the big two-parter the one man's worth part one and part two which did air back to back i said mercifully because you never know where they're gonna air this stuff in or out of order so it was back to back in september 1996 was it or 95 95, because I was still eight. (laughs) How do you remember that? Because I looked at the date when they came out and did the math. Okay. And it's another time travel thing. So I guess with the X-Men, when you're dealing with time travel, you got to have Bishop, you got to have Cable, right? Those are Givens and maybe Forge. So those three, if you run into an X-Men property that has those three in it, you know time travel is going to be involved. 
kind of their thing. Yes, two out of the three. So you get this picnic going on at the beginning, and then all of a sudden, all heck breaks loose. So whatever happens, happens outside of the bounds of the picnic, right? And you are suddenly transferred to an alternate universe, and we know that because they tell it to us right there on the screen in big, big letters. Well, it starts off in the future, 2055, and then alternative present, same day. It's important to get that same day in there, alternative present. So they all of a sudden pop up as Storm and Wolverine are now married. And if you're a comic book reader, you know that happens. And uh, one of the things about X-Men, they've been rebooted so many times, but there was a time when Wolverine and Storm had a thing. And it made sense in that particular time with that particular writer and artist team. I don't know about now. Well, and instead of Xavier, Magneto is the lead of the resistance and the world is overcome by these robot crawlers and stuff like that. So you've got bad things happening and the world is really apocalyptic. You've got major cities that are falling and you've got bad guys that are sitting there trying to take over the world and then make sure all mutants are dead afterwards, despite the deals that are made behind the scene and because they can't wipe the vestiges of the mutants off the planet they decide to go back in time and make sure that it happens that you ixnay xavier from a very very young age who's still bald right and still talks like he's old and everything and they basically do they go back to 1959 and Xavier is taken care of, and that is how the episode ends. This is a big cliffhanger. I mean, there's lots of fights, lots of mutant you know, mutant fights and everything. Good action-packed episode. You got the action of going back to the past and everything. And 1995, you've already had Back to the Future. So you're like, yeah, hey, this will be fine. And you've already had the time travel episodes in X-Men, the animated series. But nope, it ends, and things are not going to be looking fine. That was actually pretty good. That it was like, nope, this is over. What'd you guys think of the cliffhanger? I really like that little twist of not being what we've seen before, not being what you usually see in a Saturday morning cartoon. And anytime you can really take advantage of having a two part episode like this instead of the usual, oh, yeah, we just want to tell a longer story. This is one that really benefits from having that break between oh crap what just happened and being able to pick up and see what the results are going to be later in the next week's episode they wanted to stress how important xavier is and by failing to save xavier when they go back to the future things are even worse because Master Mold actually succeeded. And I like how Fritz Roy has to show Master Mold the recording of Master Mold telling Fritz Roy to make sure he does a recording to show himself in case he succeeds because he wouldn't remember. Which actually is true because when you're outside of time, you understand what happens and how things change but if you're not you're not going to have a memory of it and of course master mold is like sure i believe you go out of the room okay nimrod make sure you kill them make sure the people you want to kill are out of earshot before you give the order to have them killed but the door stops all sound <laughs> yeah that was kind of funny it was a nod to kids being able to hear their parents in the bedroom with the door sh shut or whatever, right? So that was kind of a nod to that going on. I like that. Did you guys pick up on the cameos in this episode? 
So there was a lot of extra mutants in there because they were being hunting and everything. There was Mimic for a while, Mastermind. There was Mr. Sinister walking around in the background. I don't know if you caught that or not. And then do you guys remember the team that was fighting together? It was the Evil Avengers. Cool. I saw Sinister. I thought that was interesting how Mr. Sinister actually joins the fight with Magneto against the big angry robots. Because when it comes down to it, if the mutants are being fought into extinction, then everybody is going to fight together. I mean, it's, you, you just ally with everybody because you all are being killed. It's not like you're going to sit back and say, oh, it's okay if Magneto gets killed because you might need him in the fight, right? Well, then they got that big cameo. And if I was watching this in September 1995, which I wasn't, but if I was, I'd be like, oh, I can't wait till next Saturday morning. This is so cool. What happened? It was probably a big thing at school, you know, in grade school at the time. I was not in grade school at the time, but yeah, I, th I could just see it as being like, oh, did you see the X-Men on Saturday? And some poor kid's probably like, no, my parents took me to this trip. I didn't know I had to play baseball or, you know, whatever it is, right? So you're trying to catch up on this because there were no reruns back then. Definitely. There was no on demand. You didn't get to see it. I guess you might have been able to VCR it, but it's probably a big week of suspense in terms of X-Men, the animated series and Saturday morning cartoons. But then you get the second part, the one man's worth part two, and you get the fights and they go back to present day and back and forth. It reminded me a lot of Back to the Future, because there was three timelines, right? There was the far-off future, there was the present day, and then there was the far-off past. Did anybody else get that feel from it, that those were the Back to the Future time frames? Yes. And it's one of those, oh, we did something, let's go back, and oh, wow, I have a new house now. Or... I lost the book and now Biff is in charge of everything. It was, it's interesting how they did all of this. And because Storm, I'm just going to jump to the end because Storm and Wolverine had the bracelets. They could remember themselves. And as long as the bracelets kept their power, they could be themselves for a couple of days, but they didn't wait a couple of days. They both like pressed off at the same time and kissed and it was just the wonderful end to the relationship because they have lived the entire time and they get married they get this relationship and everything like that they realize that the timeline as chris as you were alluding to before the timeline has to shift so what are you going to give up they give up their lives they give up their marriage and everything it was very impactful and as we've seen in the main run of the comics and everything they still have a relationship between them it's just nowhere near the relationship they have in this horrible future and it sucks for them because you have these two characters that obviously want something and there's a way that they can get it as long as the rest of the world is complete crap and because they're good guys they have to go and save the entire world and they never get what they want I did appreciate in 2055 where they were leaving people behind. They're like, just go ahead, go. If this works out, everything will work out. Don't worry what happens to me sort of thing. Right. So you have that going on. And then in the 1959 at the college, you get the scene where you have the two groups it's the same group, right? Two different times. And I just thought it was kind of cool. And then they poof, they, they just vanish. So I'm not sure how the time mechanics work in all this thing. I'm not going to spend the brain power to try to figure it out because it's just a kid's cartoon from the 1990s. But that was kind of weird how they were still there. But the people that were also there from the future who had bracelets, by the way, some of them anyway, they just poof. So I don't know what determines the poof and what does not determine the poof. My brain hurts. We're going to need a time physicist for this one. <laughs> All right, so Fitzroy and Bantam. I don't remember seeing them in previous episodes, but it's been a while since we've watched the previous three and a half seasons, so uh, those are new characters for this? I think so. 
Okay. For me either. Shall is anything else about these episodes draw you? It's interesting when you make something in 1995 and you think 2055 is so long away. It is now 2022. 1995 was 27 years ago and 2055 is 33 years from now. That's interesting. We're almost at the halfway point, right? Yes. They did go far enough in the future. I guess for storytellers, that's an important note. If you're telling a time travel story, if you want your story to be timeless in that it will go over two, maybe three generations, you have to choose that far off time past the lifespan of the youngest person that is watching it, right? If you are doing such a similar time travel story today and say you're thinking somebody eight years old is going to watch this and the lifespan is 75 years into the future for that eight-year-old now you have to make it's 2022 you said you have to go 75 years in the future so that's 2097 that you're looking at almost 2100 basically in order to make the story watchable by that eight-year-old throughout their lifetime. Not that it really matters in terms of monetization, but you want to try to monetize these as long as possible, right? So I guess from a storytelling standpoint, you have to take that into account. You also have to take into account how long are the people that are in the story going to be alive so that they can see themselves in the future and in the past sort of thing. So maybe that 75 years is not quite doable. I don't know. Because Magneto is alive in 2055, right? Yeah. In the example I just gave, I know I'm bending a lot of minds here, but if I, in the example if I just gave, if this was made today and Magneto was alive today, he would also have to be alive in 2097. So that might be a stretch too. So there, there's probably this middle ground between the lifespan of the youngest person that's watching the story and then the lifespan of like a 20 or 25 year old that's like 75 ish. So maybe 50 years is the extent of a time travel story that you can do. I don't know. It's like the back to the future thing when people actually. Went, oh, this is the day Marty went to in the future. Yeah. And they compared it to now. It's like, we don't have Jaws 45 with the 3D movie moniker sort of deal. But we did have Sharknado 7 or whatever it was. That's true. And shoes that can tie themselves. Yeah, we have something, but it's not like it. And mercifully, we don't have fax machines anymore. Speak for yourself. <laughs> and we don't quite have hoverboards. Not quite. Getting there, getting close, but not quite. I like a good time travel story. I've been making a little bit of fun of it. So there is that. How many time travel stories can you fit in the same cartoon run, though? I mean, that's not specifically like, I don't know, Time Bandits or something like that, where all they do is travel, like Quantum Leap. So it's just a normal sci-fi thing. You take a look at Star Trek, any of the Star Trek series, how many time travel things could they put in the entire series? I don't have the answer to that off the top of my head. I know it's more than one, but it's not like a dozen. How many is too many? I don't know. And here's the thing. Does Xavier remember? It's a tough one, right? Because he was drained of all of his memories at the or his energy in order for Fitzroy to travel to back to the future. So I don't know. I don't know what he remembers when he does. And, and if he does remember when he gets to that day of the picnic, he should know better, right? 
Well, see, that's a time travel thing. So I guess at the beginning of the picnic, technically the time wave hadn't hit yet. The time wave hits. All the time shenanigans happen. The timeline's fixed. He read the minds of all the time travelers. That is one of the things that he did do in order. Everybody is like, okay, here's a, here's a, here's a psychic. You want to know if I'm telling the truth? Like, read my mind. And he did. He read the minds of everyone in order to be like, oh, yeah, you are telling the truth. And only his energy was drained, not his memories. So when everything set back, the time shenanigans are over. So because the time shenanigans are now over in that space, past Xavier experienced all these thingies. And now present Xavier, because he looks at Storm and Wolverine with this whole, maybe they can get together now. It's like all of a sudden, Professor X is a shipper. Well, okay. If you can read people's minds, I think that would inherently become part of what you would do. Like, okay, they have an attraction to each other. Maybe I could do some things to kind of force that a little bit more than normally would happen. It's just inherent in mind reading, in my opinion. There's also the whole aspect of he knows what happened the first time. And does he let it all happen again? Because he knows that that's what needs to happen for everything to get fixed because they're in a giant loop and he's stuck there forever. And also, you're assuming you're the good guy, right? Because if you take a look at Back to the Future, this is out there quite a bit. What is to say that what happens to Marty and Doc is what is good? I mean, from Biff's perspective, it's bad, right? So it's all a matter of perspective of whether it's good or not. How selfish do you want to be? Well, I mean, given the opportunity, I'll take the riches. All right. I enjoyed at least the last two of these episodes. The first one was okay. It wasn't bad. It wasn't great, in my opinion. You did have most of the team together. The last two, time travel, I'm all in on the time travel. So that was fine for me. Lots of questions, though. Lots and lots and lots of questions. What do you guys think? Thumbs up, thumbs down? Michelle? I enjoyed them. And it really does show how important Xavier is. I really enjoyed all of them. Time travel, like SP, I, I'm a sucker. So it's going to take a lot for me to not like a time travel episode. I will admit that the Nightcrawler episode for me was a definitely the worst of the three but part of that is because the show was really showing its canadianness when rogue called gambit a hoser she did okay let me ask you this did you like the nightcrawler episode better than the iceman episode or did you like the iceman episode better than the nightcrawler episode i'm not sure it's part of it is because it's just been way too long since i've seen the iceman one I liked the Nightcrawler one because one of the things about the Iceman episode was his girlfriend faked her kidnapping. Who does that? That was so, you didn't have to go out there. You could have just sent him, okay, nowadays you just send him a text and be like, I'm out. Or you could have by then pulled a sex in the city and broke up by post-it. Whatever way, he didn't have to do this elaborate thing because that made him go and try to find him. This became, it grew out of a local situation. They ended up going skiing there. Rogue's idea, I want to go skiing. Let's go skiing. It became a more natural outgrowth of the events there. One could argue that Nightcrawler's brother, you know, the, the monk who called himself the brother, was just as bad as the girlfriend, though. 
in duping everybody and playing this game that he was playing. He wasn't really playing a game. He just wanted to protect Nightcrawler. Okay. Chris? Yeah, I think he was just wanting to keep Nightcrawler safe. He knew that Nightcrawler was not a bad person. Knew. I mean, it probably helped that Nightcrawler has this big old accepting of their religious beliefs. But, you know, Nightcrawler hadn't done anything wrong besides existing. And, you know, he's allowed to exist just like, hey, Thor. Bodhi is allowed to exist. I don't have any experience with that kind of thing at all in my house. <laughs> One character that we were missing in all three of these episodes was Jubilee. We didn't get any Jubilee, right? Kind of miss her. No Jean Grey and no Cyclops. Yes, no Cyclops. I was trying to think of like if one of the cameos in the future were Cyclops, and I think maybe there was, but there was no dialogue or anything like that in the future there. So yeah, there are Cyclops, no Scott Summers. All right, well, next time we will be talking about X-Men, the animated series, season four, episodes 11 through 14. We're running out of season four episodes, and then we will be running out of season five episodes. This has been a fun rewatch. If you like X-Men, the animated series, let us know. And if you have anything to say about the episodes that we watched, let us know that as well. In the meantime, we have some important news announcements to get to. While we are a Marvel podcast, we have to acknowledge when someone of note passes away. And Kevin Conroy, the legendary Batman voice actor, has passed away at age 66. He had been ill for some time. Conroy is widely known for his leading voice to the Cape Crusader in the 1990s hit animated series Batman, the animated series, along with other projects from Warner Brothers Animation. The actor quickly became the definitive voice for the Dark Knight while also making a live action appearance in the CW crossover event Crisis on Infinite Earths, portraying an older Bruce Wayne from Earth 99. Some of his other live action roles came in Dynasty, Matlock, Murphy Brown, and Cheers. Kevin Conroy was a fixture on the convention scene as well, taking time out of his busy schedule. There's also a great story of him being shared post when 9-11 was happening, he ended up in this with firefighters and one of them like recognized him as the voice and he brought him in a room with other, I think other firefighters or other survivors, you know, other survivors. And the person was like, this is the voice of Batman. And someone's like, prove it. And then he did it. And it's like, one of the things that he talks about is just realizing that, you know, his talent can impact other people and yes it was like a tragic moment but sometimes you do need to see the light in a tragic moment and it just kind of brought some joy to some people realizing that they're in the same room with the voice of batman like just sucks and he has been Batman for basically my entire life from everything that I have seen from him and seen people talk about with him. Just a wonderful person. And if you can get a hold of it, which DC is making very easy to get a hold of it right now on their whatever they're calling their comic app right now. You can go check out the story he wrote in the 2022 DC Pride anthology called Finding Batman. 
One of the things that I've seen from him recently, of course, Crisis. We saw him in Crisis, Michelle, when we covered it on Sterling Tribune. But another thing, as we were starting our coverage with X-Men, the animated series, I was trying to find some information online, any information I could about Margaret Lesh that led me to the Batman animated series anniversary documentary that was made. And of course, he was a big part of that. And you really get to see him kind of in his natural environment because it, it was behind the camera. It wasn't in front of a, a big crowd, although he played to the crowd. But it was just him being very cerebral and just very acknowledgement of, of, of the fan, very thankful of the fans. But just v- you get to see how seriously he took the character and what a good performer that he was and just general good guy that he was because he never took credit for himself. He always gave credit for the series to other people. And if you ever get a chance to watch it, it's on YouTube. It's like their 30th anniversary documentary that's out there for Batman, the animated series. I'll try to find the link to it and put it in the show notes, but that was amazing. And it was just a few years ago as well. So you get to see him in his later years. And then I also wanted to point out X-Men, the animated series also had a passing away in the last few years of a main character. The voice actor that played Cyclops, Kirby Moreau, also passed away back in 2020, in November 2020. It was not COVID related. Very sad story, but we're starting to lose these characters that played in these 90s impactful animated series. And Kevin was one, Kirby Moreau is another. So just wanted to kind of bring it back to the X-Men, the animated series. Even though Kevin wasn't in the X-Men animated series and they were kind of sort of competitive uh, between the two. They were both on Fox Kids in the 90s at the same time. Both amazing series. Anything else, Michelle? No, I am putting a link in the show doc to the story that I was talking about when he went into the food kitchen for 9-11, just so you can get more information about, about that. And I will, again, try to put the documentary in there of Batman, the animated series as well. Another story that was covered this week was Tom Holland reportedly is closing a deal to star in Spider-Man 4. This was reported on the direct.com. Tom Holland has reportedly closed a deal to return as Peter Parker slash Spider-Man in Sony Pictures and Marvel Studios' upcoming Spider-Man 4. According to multiple insiders on Twitter via the direct, Holland has signaled a new Marvel and Sony contract that will see the actor return to the Marvel Cinematic Universe as the beloved wall crawler. While it is currently unknown how many films the new deal will cover, Cosmic Circus's Alex Perez tweeted that, quote, Holland's contract does not feature Disney Plus appearances, unquote, which will surely disappoint fans who are hoping to see the web slinger cameo in the upcoming Daredevil Born Again. At the time of writing, reps for Marvel, Sony, and Holland have not responded to the recent contract reports. On one hand, I'm not surprised. On the other hand, I'm like, I don't know exactly how far they're going to take the Peter Parker character in the future. And as far as Disney+, Plus, I will say that I think it's more important to have Miles Morales involved rather than Peter Parker. And I don't know if they're ever going to do an intersection between the two. That is either Sony Pictures or Marvel slash Disney Plus anyway. But this is encouraging that at least it's being talked about. Who knows? Maybe we'll get a story in a couple of months, say all cont- all talks have broken down because Sony and Disney are back at it again or whatever. But it's encouraging at least. We need some resolution to the whole no one knows who Peter Parker is breaking deal that breaks the timeline and is so silly and perhaps by fixing all of this we can bring in Gwen and Miles because it takes all of them together to fix the mess that Peter Parker made with Doctor Strange and then we can just sort of erase that film Look, I thought it was interesting to get 
all the Spider-Men together and everything, but the whole Doctor Strange spell, let everybody forget who he is deal raises more plot holes than it, you know, does. But hey, if we can get a Spider-Man for to fix it and to make Chris finally happy and also me happy because I do want to see Miles Morales, then I'm for it. Oh, so you want to see Miles Morales? He's right here. Good. And we can have Gwen. Yeah, we do have rumors that because of what had happened, that they were going to try to bring in multiple Mary Janes and multiple Gwen Stacys together as well. I don't know. We'll see where they go. Who knows? They tend to get a little bit more simplistic when they actually get to the screen than the fanciful ideas of the fans out there. But we'll see. All right, Chris, we also have some Deadpool 3 rumors and news. Being Deadpool 3, of course, you have to be thematically on point here. And there's kind of three different stories that are all coming together. First off, we have Owen Wilson reportedly is going to be coming back as Agent Mobius for Deadpool 3. He could be joining Ryan Reynolds in there. A recent report from Daniel RPK suggests that Loki's breakout character, Agent Mobius, could feature in Wade Wilson's first Marvel Cinematic outing. It's claimed that the timeline hopping investigator could play a major part in the film, leading many fans to speculate that Deadpool 3 will include some multiversal shenanigans. It's Deadpool, why wouldn't it? But nobody is willing to really say anything about that from the official fronts. Yeah, anything that comes from Daniel RPK right now, I think is interesting to note because there is some history there of getting actual scoops, but at the same time, there's no verification. So when you see verification, you'll see like Variety or Deadline or something like that scoop in and say, okay, we've confirmed this. This is an exclusive. But for now, it's just Daniel RPK. It's an indication. It's the canary in the coal mine sort of thing. So we'll see what happens. But wait, there's more. Deadpool 3 could revisit some previous Fox franchises, including the Fantastic Four. So here's the fun part. You have all those X-Men characters that, depending on your view of Deadpool, could be a supernatural fit if you see him as an X-Men character. You have the Fantastic Four movies, which may or may not exist, depending on your opinion of them. You also maybe somehow have the Roger Corman Fantastic Four, where they could just have it be a reference the Easter egg that it exists. Like, oh, we thought there was another family out there. You know, just something for the people who know about it already. And bring in everything. And it could just be, I think, a really cool way to tie in what used to be, or hopefully in the future used to be, completely separate comic book movie universes. You know, before Crisis, I would say, you're crazy. But Crisis managed to pull together every single DC property out there, including the 89 Batman property. They did it. They pulled everything together. So if DC can do that with Crisis, you bet you Marvel can do it with Deadpool. I could absolutely see Deadpool pulling something like this off as a nod, as a little reference to, hey, here's what's upcoming with Fantastic Four in a jokey manner. Yeah, I could see them doing it. I have no idea if it's going to happen again. This is Daniel RPK, but there is some history with Daniel RPK. So I don't know. It could be possible. Could be possible. Michelle, would you like to see a crisis level thing here in Deadpool 3 with Fantastic Four? Yes, and if they could get Chris Evans to do his the human Johnny, torch. Yeah. yes, the human yeah. torch, everybody would explode. It would be like the fans; all the fans would just explode because because also Michael B. Jordan. Mm-hmm. One of the things, one of the memes, one of my favorite memes is that 
playing the human torch prepares you to be a better actor in the Marvel, you know, MCU. There's that meme. So to be able to bring them back that way, just for a moment, would be hilarious and amazing. And Chris Evans has come out and said he misses it. He said it was great while it was going on. It's over now. But I, I do miss it. So he's he's basically saying, I miss being involved, guys. You can throw me in a little cameo here and there. Well, guess what? You can't have the, it's not just Captain America. There's Johnny with the human torch in there. So I don't know. Speaking of fans exploding, though, Ryan Reynolds has a bit of a dream for who he would like to have a cameo appearance in Deadpool 3. We all know that celebrities like being in the Marvel Cinematic Universe because it makes their kids and family members think that they're cool, and they're not wrong. We all know that Ryan Reynolds can pull off some magical things, as evidenced by the fact that these Deadpool movies exist. But E.T. is reporting that Ryan Reynolds has a specific target in mind here. That target being this little singer everybody might have heard of named Taylor Swift. I hear she's popular with the kids. Now, by little, you're not talking about short shaming, shaming, right? Height shaming? Oh, no, I'm pretty sure she's taller than me. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, that'd be kind of fun. Talking about Marvel actors that have been in the MCU that their kids don't believe it's them. You know, Paul Bettany had that thing for years because he was the voice of the suit, right? And his girls were like, you're not in there. You're not in there. And then finally, when he showed up as Vision there, they still kind of were like, that's not you, is it? <laughs> and then, you know, of course, in one division, it was actually him. And so they were gaga over that. So, yeah, this would be awesome with Taylor Swift coming in. I have little hope that it's actually going to happen. But Ryan Reynolds could speak this into existence, just like some of the cameos that were in She-Hulk. So who knows? I would prefer salt and pepper, but <laughs> that Taylor Swift and them, that would be amazing. That would be fun. Right. And of course, as we're recording this, the Black Panther Wakanda Forever film has debuted. We're actually going to cover it in a couple of weeks from now, but there was a lot of news about that that we didn't cover this week just because we weren't covering the film and we didn't want to spoil anything. But there's also other news out there about the making of documentary of Werewolf by Night. There was some Agatha Coven of Chaos news out there. There was some Daredevil Born Again filming locations and times thrown in there. And then a Courtney Cox rumor as well. So that will all be in the show notes. Go to legendsofshield.com and you can get all of that. Well, Chris, what should we do now? I think that we should all go jump in a loop and just go have a good time. It's kind of funny to me because the bump that was just played was having a good time. Oh, wow. I didn't even know I could be that synergistic. Yeah, that's actually the name of it. Having a good time. I'll show it to you later. Anyway, thank you very much to everybody that continues to listen to our show and stay with us as we continue down our path of Disney Plus shows and the MCU movies. We really appreciate you and we really appreciate your comics, particularly on the comments, not comics, comments on our Discord server at gunnageek.com slash Discord. Yes, thank you to everyone who listens and downloads and interacts with us. We always appreciate you taking time out of your day to consume our content. And you can find me on Twitter at shell underscore game. Everybody who listens lets us into their ear holes and worming our way into their brains is just a wonderful thing for us, knowing that you trust us to entertain and inform you. And if you like hearing me entertain and mostly getting other people to inform you, you can check out Play Comics over at playcomics.com. For right now, I'm still on Twitter at Play Comics Cast. We'll see how that dumpster fire goes. 
<laughs> it is a dumpster fire. Even I will admit that Twitter is being a dumpster fire lately. By the way, in the past week, I've had a couple of guest appearances come out. One was on TV's Travis's Wait, Have You Seen? We talked about the 12 Monkeys film from 1995. I talked a lot about the sci-fi series that came out, the differences between the two. And I actually started a rewatch of 12 Monkeys, the TV series, because of it. Because it's, in my opinion, so much better than the movie. And then also, I was asked to help out another podcaster. Kate over with Ignorance was Bliss. She asked me to do the intro and outro for her episode and her interview. I did that, so you can get catch that at Ignorance was Bliss. Also, in case you haven't heard, Better Podcasting is back, the main show. We talked about what the future is going to be in the second episode, which should come out roughly at the same time that this does and gets published. We talk about anonymous podcasting. Make sure you catch that. There'll be some tidbits in there about me in there. And then I also, on Better Podcasting Chats with SP, had a conversation with a podcaster about marijuana. She does Cadabra, Miss Cadabra. She does the Smoke to Smoke podcast. So it was very interesting talking to her about what she's been able to do and what she's not been able to do about her podcast. All right, guys, that's it for me. Until next time, I'm Director SP. I'm Agent Michelle. And I'm Agent Chris. All right, let's spin up the time machine and do this all over again. This time on episode 451 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunageek.com and you will find all our contact information and other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod, found at incompetech.com and also artists on pond5.com and audiojungle.net. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual hosts and do not represent Stargate Pioneer Productions, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation, Marvel Studios, and ABC. No infringement is intended. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is copyright 2013 through 2022.